So now let's walk through an example of modeling value objects from domain concepts. In this case, we have an online store checkout process. We know the price of the order and we want to apply a discount code to reduce the price by 50%. We might start off with a naive implementation like this. Our price is 1021 and we can see here that our discount is 0.5, which is the decimal notation for 50%. We calculate the discount total by multiplying 0.5 times the product price, then reduce the total price by that amount to arrive at the order total. Ultimately, we end up with a result of 5.105. This is somewhat problematic due to the fact that we end up with a fractional cent. But it's not the only problem that this code has. For one, there are a number of hidden complexities that aren't being modeled explicitly. Okay, let's look at a few ways we might solve this fractional cent issue. Here, we're calculating the discounted price just like we did before, but now we're rounding the value using PHP's number format function. It's going to round to the hundredth place, like what we expect from money. Our discount price is now 511. Okay, so we're not 100% certain this is the right solution. After all, it's the multiplication by the real number that produces the fractional cent. Let's try to round the product of that operation instead of the difference of the price and the discount. Now since both the product price and discount amount are precise to the hundredth place, our discounted price is guaranteed to be as well. Now our discounted price is 510. Okay, so we have three solutions and each results in a different value. Which one's correct? It's actually entirely possible that any of the three is the correct solution. Fractional cents may not be something that we always work with, but they certainly exist in many domains. So how do we know what to do? There are many situations in which the developer is the person making decisions about financial transactions. However, in this example, that's not the case. We need to go to the domain expert. The domain expert for this situation is the person who knows how to correctly process this discount. After all, we absolutely don't want to be creating financial bookkeeping problems just because we didn't take the time to understand how what we're building should work. So, we ask our domain expert, and the solution is to round the discount down. Here, we did the right thing. Since we're not the domain expert for our business's financials, we took the time to get to know the domain so that we could implement it correctly. Now, one major problem with this code is that we'll need to implement the algorithms every time we need to make a price calculation. If the logic for calculating discounts changes, we'll need to track down all of the code and make the correct changes. If we make a mistake, then it might appear that the calculations are working correctly. But somewhere the calculations will be wrong, potentially leading to bookkeeping errors. This is because we have this domain concept of money that isn't modeled in our application. We're using language primitives, in this case, floating point numbers, to represent amounts of money. There's a number of rules for applying arithmetic to the domain of money that aren't being modeled here. I'm sure that you're screaming at your monitor about using floating point numbers for money. If you don't know why this is bad, pause this video and do a cursory search. It's worth understanding. We don't want to use floats for money. Let's model money as a value object so that we have a way to explicitly define all of the peculiarities that come with the domain of money for this application. Since we're representing money with a value object, it's important to make the distinction that our price variable here has a reference to an object that represents not an arbitrary amount of money, but a very specific amount of money, 10 euros and 21 cents. This object can't be changed. It doesn't make sense that 10 euros and 21 cents can become 11 euros. No matter what the price is, we're unable to change the fundamental nature of 10 euros and 21 cents. But that doesn't mean that we can't change the price of our product. We simply assign a new price, a new value. Now let's take a look at an implementation to see how we can represent money with value objects. First, let's take a look at our currency class. For our implementation, this class isn't going to get any more complex. It exists solely to differentiate one currency from another. So you can see that it takes a type and then has the capability to compare itself to another currency implemented as the equals method. So now that we can distinguish currencies, let's take a look at the money class. Now this class, on the other hand, is not in its final form. We're going to build it bit by bit as we identify new requirements. Let's go over what we have. When instantiating, we need to inject the amount and the currency into the object. This way we'll know how much and of what type of money the object represents. Now you'll notice that we're multiplying the amount by 100 and storing the value as cents. No longer do we store a real number, instead we store an integer. The application's level of precision is down to the cent, but in many domains you'll need to track money to a precision level of 8 decimal positions or more. 
This is entirely guided by the requirements of your domain. Okay, so let's add some behavior to this object. It's easy to imagine that we're going to need to be able to add two amounts of money together. Maybe it looks something like this. Notice how the subtotal is an entirely new object. Since these objects can't be changed, they create new objects with new values. At first, this may seem a bit strange, but it helps to reduce application complexity by quite a bit. So here's our current add method. We add the sense value of the current object to the sense value of the incoming object. Then we create a new instance of money using the currency of the original object. If it seems strange that we have direct access to a private field of a completely different object, then it may be important to note that in many programming languages, including PHP, private visibility is about information encapsulation. It's related to the class and not the instance. Since it's natural that our money object understands its implementation, and any other instance of the money class has the same implementation, we have direct access to all of them. Now let's look at another problem that we have with our model. If we try to add these two amounts together, we come out with $15.21. We're probably familiar enough with the domain of money to know that you can't directly add US dollars and euros without having to consult an expert. So we're going to need to fix our add method to correctly reflect the requirements of the domain. So we need to add a guard to our add method. We need to make sure that we can't add two amounts of money with different currencies together so let's compare the currencies between the objects. We use the equals method on the currencies to check if one matches the other. If it doesn't, we throw an exception. When we throw the exception, control is ejected from this scope of code. Consequently, it's impossible to create a new object that adds together two different types of currencies. By using an exception, we then delegate handling of this error to a different scope of our application. Let's make a few more improvements. Currently, we're relying on strings to instantiate new instances. Let's make this concept explicit. First, we make the constructor private. In this way, the constructor can be called from inside the class, but cannot be called from outside. We can't now new up an instance of the money object. Then, let's create two methods that become our new public constructors. One allows us to create a money object from a string, one allows us to create one from a number of cents. This code doesn't try to hide the complexity of money. Instead, it makes every aspect of it explicit so that we can understand how it works and why it works that way as easily as possible. If it's hard to understand how something works, then it becomes very easy to introduce bugs. If it's hard to understand why something works the way that it does, then it becomes very easy to intentionally build something that unintentionally is wrong. It's finally time to resolve the problem of discount calculation. We'll call the method reduced by percent. The discount price is the price reduced by 50%. So we talk to our domain expert, the person in our business who should be making the decision about how this calculation works. They say that we should round the discount itself and that we should round half pennies up to full pennies, otherwise round them down. All right, so we solve the problem of rounding by consulting our financial expert. We solve the problem of money logic being spread all around our application by modeling money as a value object that can be reused in those different locations. We solve the problem of floating point math by storing the money amount as an integer at the requisite level of precision so that we can use integer math instead of floating point math. And finally, we've centralized and hit a lot of the details behind an easy to understand API without using magic to hide the complexity. Not too bad. Now, that's not to say that this isn't still a naive view of money. It may well work for us in our application, but it's extremely important that we understand exactly how the business thinks of money when we're implementing it in our apps. It's sometimes strange to think about how the precise details around handling money are scrutinized carefully in an accountant's work, but often not paid attention to at all in the software that we develop. Now let's take a brief look at one final example. We've talked about how identity is an abstract concept that allows an individual to be differentiated from others in a group. We've talked about how the implementation of an identity might be a string or a number or binary data. This is an implementation of an ID as a value object. The implementation uses UUIDs. It's possible to generate an invoice ID before an invoice object is ever instantiated. This allows our invoice, which in our case fundamentally requires identity, to be consistent from the moment it's created. We don't have to hit a database to get an auto increment ID or do any other additional process we have it from the start. 